We are a community of people. Some of us are family, some of us are friends, some of us are just acquaintances. But we are a community of people. People from all over, from all walks of life, from all kinds of pasts, and from all kinds of presents. And yet, no matter how much or how little we know each other, no matter how different our backgrounds may be, one thing ties us all together. We are a people, we are family, and we are friends who are chasing, who are running after, and who are pursuing the kingdom of God the way God wants things to be. Thy will be done, and on earth as it is in heaven. We are a community of people, and we are chasing after the kingdom. We are Journey Church. Journey has always strived to be the church that Bullock County needs. Our focus has been on creating a community of people who are chasing after the kingdom. During difficult times such as these, we want to be showing compassion, love, and to offer a helping hand to those who are struggling. While we want to make sure we're meeting the spiritual needs of our neighbors, we also want to be able to offer food, clothing, and other support. This is a time where you can help partner with us to be able to continue meeting those needs. 
Your gift, no matter how small, will help us to continue our efforts of helping our friends and neighbors. Your donations allow us to assist in those in our church, as well as outside, in groups like Eleven Choice, Scarlet Hope, and Bullock County Housing First. Download the app to partner with us and give once or set up recurring giving so that we may continue to make an impact in our community. All right, good morning, Journey Church. I hope you guys are doing well. Uh, spring is upon us. Uh, the weather is beautiful. Um, Easter is next week, and we're super excited about Easter and all that it means. It's a little odd, though, uh, not being able to meet together on Easter, and so we will be bringing content for you guys uh, starting next week, and we're super excited about that. And so I hope you guys are doing well. Uh, me and my wife bought chickens yesterday, um, and so that's a grand experiment. Our, our kids talked us into it, and so we have chickens now, and so it is fully spring. And yet here we are, and we find ourselves in this moment. And we have to, as best as we can, remember it is just a moment. It's just a period of time. And the other thing is not only is it just a moment, but we have to remember that all of us are in it. And so for every one of you who finds yourself on the edge right now, you find yourself a little jittery, you find yourself with a little bit of low grade, even possibly dread, we're here, all of us. Perhaps you find yourself a little twitchy, jumpy, and maybe right now you can't quite name the feelings that you have. You find yourself a little bit on edge. It's all of us, and we're here. And some of you may be wondering what's wrong with you, but I'm here to tell you it's not just you, it's all of us. You're not the only one, and we're all going through this. It's this moment of solidarity where we all realize something bigger than any of us is going on. It's also this moment we remember that it's not just the news reports that we see. It's, it's not just our friends and family that are talking about it. It's this reality that all of us are deeply connected to each other. And so what I want to do is take a minute and talk about this. There's the disease, but then as I heard someone recently say, there's also the dis-ease that comes with it. We all have this, this feeling that something's not right. See, with disease, you can be sick, you can have an illness, you can be diagnosed literally, factually, medically. But then there's this other thing that's setting right beside it. It's what we add to the disease. It's this sense of our vulnerability, the sense that the modern world that is more sophisticated, advanced than ever, is actually also incredibly fragile. That we have for generations now have been, been playing this game where we keep inventing new ways to keep ourselves safe. And yet in this moment, it's revealed that we actually aren't as safe as we thought. It's like our frailty has been exposed. And maybe for some of you, this coronavirus brings up all kinds of other things. This existential kind of crisis. And by that meaning, maybe it's a dread about the fabric of the universe that we call home. Questions arise, maybe within some of us, what kind of place is this? What is life and what it's about? Is it a cold, dark place, or is this place full of love and safety that we had hoped? There are these big questions that are at the heart of our existence, and typically we distract ourselves enough to not have to deal with any of that. We have all these distractions in life, so we don't have to process that type of information. But yet here we are. Normally, we're so busy, we're running from one thing to another. We have enough Netflix, we have enough friends, we have enough places to go that we don't have to deal with it. And now, right now, here we are in the middle of it. And we still have our our Netflix shows. I mean, could Tiger King have not come at a more perfect time? But all the other things are starting to be stripped from us. All of the other distractions are being stripped away. And sometimes what happens is in these moments, you have to deal with a lot of stuff that you've been so far able to push down. Stuff that you haven't had to deal with. Fears and questions that arise. And now all of a sudden, it's here. And some of us, we've still gotten really good at pushing it down. At least we try. But then for those of us that have kids, kids haven't learned all the numbing and coping mechanisms, and so they just feel it. 
And so they ask questions, the questions that we don't want to try to answer. And what happens so often is when these kids start to talk and our kids start to talk and ask the questions, what we realize is they're expressing the thing that all of us really are feeling. Just that we've gotten really good at pushing it all down. But when your kid voices it, it's this realization that all of us are there. And so that's the moment that we're in. And so what do we do with this? Well, well, there's this book. It's actually a collection of books filled with poems and stories and letters, and it's been preserved through the years. And for a long time, people have turned to this book. And what's amazing about this book is it's full of stories and narratives written and taking place in the midst of extreme uncertainty. See, we often forget that when we read the Bible, we're reading the Bible on this side of history. We know how things pan out. We know how things go. But we have to understand is in the moments, in the stories, in the letters, in the poems that we read, these are the lives of real men and women who didn't know what was going to happen. They didn't know what was going to happen next. The stories of families and people who face extreme uncertainty. And as we, as families and people, as a nation, as a culture, as we face this uncertainty and we all have this uneasy feeling, maybe this is the perfect time and the perfect place to run to because this book is still an unfolding story. See, all the stories that you grew up listening to, all the stories that you know and you love, maybe your favorite passage, maybe your favorite scripture, your favorite psalm or proverb was written during a time where some person faced extreme uncertainty in their lives and for the people around them. This is not a book of stories where everything always works out exactly the way that you'd hoped and in the time frame that you want. It's just not in the Bible. Almost every single narrative, every single thing that we now draw hope from comes from troubled times. It comes from the lives of people who discovered that in the midst of uncertainty that they face that they get to a place where they realize that God was still certain. And that's why we keep turning back to it. And there's this one letter that's in the Bible. It was written to this local church, and it was written by this guy named Paul. Now, now most of you probably know a little bit about Paul, but Paul is this guy. And what you have to understand is what Paul lives and the experience that he has in life is what makes these verses so credible. Because if you didn't know much about Paul, and I tell you what he's about to tell us, you might, be, you might be tempted to dismiss it, to just believe that this is just another person that hasn't lived a real life, that doesn't know what we're going through, that hasn't experienced enough or hasn't seen enough. But, but Paul's life is different. See, Paul, you have to understand, midway through his life, he comes to this moment where he realizes almost everything that he believed, everything that he grew up with, wasn't the reality, wasn't the truth that he was going towards. And so in the middle of his life, he has to change course. And what you have to realize, at this point in his life, because of what he believed before, Paul's been involved in all kinds of things. I mean, he was there in his involvement in the murder of innocent people. And he has played a part in falsely accusing and arresting people, splitting up families and villages. And then there comes this place in his life where everything that he thought he understood about how the world works, it changes. And he has to go into cultures and places that are opposed to this new worldview that he has. And he's charged with this task. He's charged with this task of going into these places, many places that are hostile towards him and his message, and starting new churches. And this upsets so many people. And eventually Paul ends up in this place where he wants to go back to Jerusalem, kind of the epicenter of everything going on in this movement at that time. And he wants to go back there, but he's warned that these Jewish leaders, they don't want him back there because they want to put a stop to what he's doing. But yet he decides that he wants to go. And eventually with enough conflict with these leaders in Rome, and he's arrested on multiple occasions, he's eventually imprisoned and put on a ship to go back to Rome to face trial. And when he's on this ship, a storm comes and blows him out of the sea or the course that he was going for two weeks. And two weeks are lost. And then eventually his ship gets on shore for three months. He's shipwrecked on this shore. And finally they get to Rome. And after years of imprisonment, 
Paul's life will be ended. And this is the God that writes this letter to these churches that still speaks to us today. And his advice that may seem impractical to many of us, but Paul would say this. He would say, I've been stoned, and not like the fun kind. No, what he was, actually people threw rocks at him, and they pushed him off a cliff thinking he was dead. And he was whipped, he was arrested, he was shipwrecked, he was snake bit, and eventually he's sitting in Rome in a prison cell in a house waiting. And in all of that, Paul writes us this. He gives us this advice as he faces extreme adversity. And he says in Philippians 4, 6, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Do not be anxious about anything. Now, for those of us that are anxious right now, that's not really helpful advice, is it? In fact, some of you out there, you you are worriers. You are people that worry. And it's not just this. You worry about a whole lot of things. And you have friends or spouses that all the time tell you, just don't worry. And never once has somebody that worried said, oh, thank you for that great advice. I've never thought about that. I'm not going to worry about it anymore. No, you look at that person, you shake your head, and you say, you just wouldn't understand. But Paul says, do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, so what situations? Your marriage situation, your job situation, your school situation, your money situation, your health situation, and the situation we find ourselves in right now. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, present your requests to God. Now, if you read that and you hear me say that and you say, okay, well, well the answer according to this is just I'm supposed to pray about it. What do you think we've been doing? I mean, there are people right now probably praying that have never prayed before. And some of us that that pray all the time, we're praying even more. And Paul's advice is just pray about it. To which we respond, well, what do you think we've been doing? We'll come back to that in a second. But but listen to what he says, okay? So if you do this, here's what's going to happen in verse 7. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say that if you pray, that it's going to work out the way that you hoped. He doesn't say that if you pray, that everything is going to be just fine and dandy, and it's all going to go exactly the way that you had planned. No, what he says is this, that if you pray, that there's this peace, this peace of God which transcends all understanding, and it will guard your hearts. See, we've all been in situations where it's easy to have peace when everything works out. It's easy to have peace when everything goes exactly the way that we had hoped it would go. But what about when it doesn't? See, it says it will guard your heart because there's going to be moments in life, and maybe it's right now, where you pray and it's not going the way that you hoped, and your heart needs to be guarded. Because as we talked about last week, it's too easy to become jaded and cynical in times like these. See, we've all had moments where we prayed and the test results came back. We've all prayed before and they still passed away. We've all prayed before and it didn't happen the way that we'd hoped. We all prayed before and things didn't change. What Paul says is we need to get to this place where we're praying, realizing that it's this peace that God gives us. It's going to get us through. And then a few verses later, one of the most famous verses that we take out of context. But before that, in verse 12, he he says this. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or living in want. And here's what Paul's saying. I basically know and have learned that no matter what's going on, how to be content, how to have peace, how to be okay. And I know for some of us, that's what we want so much right now. We want peace, and we want to have this feeling that it's going to be okay. He didn't promise us that he'll always heal us. He didn't promise us that he would always give us everything we want. He didn't promise us that it wouldn't be hard, but he did promise us he would always be with us. He did promise us that he would not leave us and he would not forsake it. And because of that, 
we get to this verse that all of us know, and we think it's about throwing touchdowns and winning Super Bowls, but it's not. He says this, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. And here's the question for you and for me. What is your all this? When you see this, I can do all of this. What is that thing that you're facing? What is that thing that you're feeling that you say, I need your strength to be able to do this? There's this moment in the life of Jesus. And, and there's this moment where, where he knows that it's coming to an end. And he's just spent some time with his disciples and he's just told them these valuable things that's going to carry them through. But, but there's this moment where what's about to happen, it, it becomes almost overwhelming to him. And what we see over and over again in these moments when Jesus has this big moment that's going to happen, he goes and he prays. And in this particular instance, he decides that he goes and he's going to pray, but he wants his disciples to go with him. Because let's be honest, there's these moments in life where we don't want to be alone. We don't want to be by ourselves. And this is this moment for Jesus. And so he takes some of his disciples, and we see this in three of the Gospels. We see this moment, but particularly in this part in Mark we're going to read. In verse 32, he says this, They went to the olive grove called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his followers, Sit here while I go and pray. He took Peter, James, and John with him, and he became deeply troubled and distressed. Look at this next verse, verse 34. He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Now, now I got to tell you, when I read this verse, Jesus, this is Jesus saying, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. It's this moment where the Creator will succumb to the created for creation. It's like this moment we, we, we can't really fully fathom. And in this moment, Jesus is having to deal with all of this. In the account that Luke gives us, it tells us this, that Jesus is sweating and it comes out like blood. And so many people write this off as this exaggeration. But what we know now is is there's this condition. It's called hematodrosis. It's this condition in which the capillary blood vessels that feed the sweat glands rupture, and they cause blood to come out. And doctors tell us that the reason this happens is because someone is under extreme physical or emotional stress. Jesus is so caught up in this moment and knowing what's going to come. Verse 35 It'll tell us that he went on a little further and he fell to the ground and he prayed that if it were possible that this hour awaiting him might pass him by. Jesus gets to the moment. Look at verse 36. Abba, Father, he cried out, everything is possible for you. Please take this cup of suffering away from me. He gets to this moment. And he says, listen, I don't want this to happen. I don't want to go through this. And yet, here he is. And he's honest, and he's real, and he's telling God what's really going on. And then he says this. But I want your will to be done, not mine. And it's like this moment where the full weight of what's happening hits. It's this moment where there's no more distractions, there's no more towns to go to, there's no more people to heal. It's this full weight of this moment that he's in right now. And he's got to deal with it. And so he prays. And he tells God how he really feels. But then he says, but what you want to happen is what I want to happen. 
And maybe that's where we are. We're we're in this moment where everything's being stripped away. And there's no more distractions. And and we're at this place where we need to be real and we need to be honest and we need to be vulnerable and we need to tell God how we really feel. Not just about this moment, but about what's really going on, about the deep questions of life that we have, of who we are and the struggles and the pain that we experienced. I mean, we are at a point where all of the gods, and that's what they are, are being stripped away from us. All of the things that we've worshipped, all of the things that we've put forward, they're all being removed. And we're at this moment, we have to ask the question, who are we and who do we put our hope in? And can we get to the place where we honestly say and we pray, I want your will to be done, not mine. And I know it's a hard place to be. But we have to remember something. See, see this, this prayer, this moment, it takes place on Friday. It takes place in this moment. This moment where the next 24 hours are going to be chaotic and horrible. But it's this moment that's not going to last forever. Because as the great Dr. S.M. Lockridge said, it's only Friday. Sunday's coming. And we're in this moment. But it will not last forever. Because it's Friday. And Easter's coming where we get to celebrate and we get to hope in a God that does not leave us, that does not forsake us, that does not abandon us, but is right there with us. And it's Friday, but it doesn't stay Friday forever. And my hope is that we find our place in Him. We find our comfort in Him. We find moments where we feel vulnerable where we feel exposed, that we get down on our knees and we're honest with him, but we come to the place of hope where we say, God, but we put our trust in you and we know the peace that you give us will get us through. So let's pray right now. Father God, a lot of us feel uncertain and we feel anxious. And God, it's not just a couple of us, it's most of us. And God, in these moments, my prayer is that we get to a place where we can face what's ahead of us. And we can say as honestly as we want, God, that we don't want to be here and we don't want to be in these moments, God, and we wish they would go away. But yet, just like Jesus, God, we get to the place where we're honest and we're real, but we get to the place where we put our trust in you and we say, not our will, but your will. And God, I I pray that we can claim what Paul talks about, that we can get to the place where it's your peace that gets us through. And God, that in these moments that your promise is real, that you will guard our hearts so that we do not become bitter, we do not become jaded, we do not become cynical. And God, where you will give us the strength to get us through this, even today, even now, and even in the things that we feel. And so, Father, we love you. God, we we pray these promises to be real in our lives. And we thank you for the grace and the mercy that you give us that get us through each day. In your son's name we pray. Amen.
I'm no longer a slave to fear. Oh, I am a child of God. And I'm no longer a slave to fear. Oh, I am a child of God. You unravel me with a melody you surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone and I'm no longer a slave to fear Oh, I am a child of God And I'm no longer a slave to fear Oh, I am a child of God Child of God. 